A Belgian dark strong also known as a Trappist quad is a complex rich and smooth ale. I'm brewing one short and shoddy style including replacing half of my fancy Belgian candy syrup with grocery store brown sugar. How will the beer turn out? Well I'm subjecting it to 23 participants and asking them how representative of the style is this beer. This episode is sponsored by our Brewlosophy Patreon members. More on that in a bit. Short and shoddy usually means an express brew day. Last time I brewed using this method, I knocked out an English IPA in just one hour and 40 minutes. But this time I'm splitting my brew day. I'm gonna work my brewing around kids' bedtime, school drop off, conference calls, and my lunch break. My brew day will consume 14 hours of elapsed time, but the idea is it's gonna fit non-disruptively around my daily life. Let's get started. It's gone 10 in the evening, put the kid to bed, did the wordle, cocoa, and uh, it's a school night. I've got to be up for work in the morning. What better time than to start brewing a beer? So I am doing this short and shoddy style where the short is really just the time I spend brewing, the time I spend in here, but the elapsed time is going to be very long. So I added some reverse osmosis water and then heated that up just before putting my kid to bed and set that to 152 Fahrenheit. It's now reached that temperature so that's what 67 Celsius. And my water salts because I'm using reverse osmosis water I do have a few of these. I've got gypsum, calcium chloride and epsom salt. And earlier today I did measure out and mill my grain. There's a lot of grains in here. Not a lot of headspace. See if it fits. It's about half of it. Mash that in. Oh yeah. This is a five and a half gallon batch. A brew father told me that the water and the grain together would make up about 8.5 gallons. Seems to be about right. Now how am I performing this mash? Well, I'm doing an overnight mash. What that means is I'm going to just leave the grains in the water here all night and my preferred way of doing that with this claw hammer system is to make sure that I'm not running the pump. I didn't want to run the pump all night just for the amount of electricity that would use and also the fact, you know, something could go wrong. But I do want to leave the heating element on and just have it cycling on and off. And to help me maintain a steady temperature throughout this, I have opted to put on the fetching black neoprene jacket onto the kettle. And actually, I think you can see here, here on the table as well. So just to try to keep the heat in, and I don't really want to have hot spots at the bottom where the heating element is and then cold spots at the top. Now I've done this before and uh, the system seems to work really well. It just flicks the power on and off as needed and is able to maintain a pretty good mash temperature. And given this is such a high gravity beer, I do find that mash conversion times are a bit longer when you have more to convert. So by running this all night, I should make sure I have a fully completed mash and I'm gonna get as much efficiency as I'm gonna get without sparging or anything like that. Temperature's dropped about 12 degrees Fahrenheit, so I'm gonna put the heat on. This will now turn the heating element on and then switch it off again when it gets to about 152. And then yeah, pulse it on and off the rest of the night. Hmm. All right, that's it. See you in the morning, good night. Now the recipe I'm using here builds on a base of Pilsner malt. I'm adding 11 pounds of modern Pilsner from Epiphany Craft Malt in this five gallon batch. Munich malt for a bit of malt depth and body. Also going in are eight ounces of aromatic malt and key to this style, at least in my book, is eight ounces of special B to darken the color and contribute notes of raisin and plum. All right, it's the next morning. I've enlisted some help to get this grain basket out. Oh, look at that. Give it a sniff. Feels like cereal, right? Oh, that's enough. Huh? Ready? Yep. Just let me get it out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. It's on. Yeah. I just spilt a little bit here. Okay, that's that. Yeah, it's gonna be hot. Not too bad. All right. Let's take him to school. 
All right, back from school drop off. Got about 45 minutes for my first call. Let's do the boil, doing a 30 minute boil. Looks like I'm at boil now, so I've got to add in my first pop addition. This is Halatau Middlesbrough. That's what I'm using for the entire batch. Uh, this is the bittering edition, 60 grams, at about 23 IBU of bitterness. And then I'll be adding in about 20 grams more uh, with five minutes to go, so around 25 IBU in total. Now, before we get to the shoddiest part of the brew day, a quick word about today's sponsor. If you're a fan of Brewlosophy, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley Hops, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. And that includes folks like Clay Disney from Jaded Brewing, the legendary CH from Homebrew for Life, and Brewlosophy's very own Will Lovell. Okay, back to the boil. With about 10 minutes left in the boil, it's time to start adding in some sugar. Now this being a Belgian dark strong, you think candy sugar, that is what I'm going for. So I've got D90, now this is dark candy sugar. This will give some sort of raisin or date or plum kind of characteristic to the beer. Put a good stir while I do it, just trying to avoid any scorching or buffing. Now this is 16 ounces and on a batch this size, I typically use two of these, but I'm gonna get the rest of my sugar from a different source. Let me get it. Brown sugar, light brown sugar. Now Brewlosophy contributor Will told me about this one. He's told me he's had quite a lot of luck in combining Belgian candy syrup and brown sugar. I thought that was quite shoddy enough to try out in my short and shoddy batch. Now I'm using light brown sugar. This will add sort of a molasses-like sweetness. I did want to go for the dark brown sugar because that could end up actually making this quite a lot darker in color. I'm already using a lot of dark syrup here. I want to use a pound of dark sugar. There's two pounds in here, but this is short and shoddy, so I'm just going to eyeball it. Now, my microphone went out for this bit, so while I talk to nobody in particular, let me explain what happened next. So for yeast, I'm using Imperial B48 Triple Double, and I was concerned about pitch rate. Now, this beer came out at 1.087, and my calculator said I needed over 400 billion yeast cells at yeast pitch. Imperial yeast packets state they come with about 200 billion yeast cells, so I'm only halfway there. Now, making a yeast starter a day or so before would have been a good idea, but this is short and shoddy, so I decided instead to make a vitality starter. Now, this won't get me to 400 billion cells, but it will wake the yeast up before their sugary feast. So I grabbed a one liter flask and sanitized it with Starsan, and I stored about 500 milliliters of wort, which at this point had been chilled down using my counterflow chiller. I popped in a stir bar, added the yeast, and placed on my stir plate. Then I transferred the rest of the wort into a fermenter and headed out for a morning of exciting work calls. Given this high starting gravity, I hooked the wort up to my infusion stone and added some oxygen. After adding the yeast, which had been spinning all morning, the beer was held at 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, and it wasn't long until the airlock was bubbling, indicating fermentation was underway. Now, it finished at 1.012 for a 9.9% beer, which is not bad for an underpitch. I presented the beer to tasters, and before we get to their results, I was also curious to see what Norm would think of this beer. Now this is 9.9%. Oh, so outstanding. We, we may not do a full pour here. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. I like to age these. Mm -hmm. This is about three months old. It's funny that three months for a beer is aging when things like whiskey. I'm talking to a whiskey guy about, <laughs> I aged it for three months. <laughs> when, when an old whiskey is 10 years <laughs> or more. Color of it is great. The, the caramel color, yeah. uh, the light brown okay. is really great. And it's got a... Uh, you know, when you poured it, it had a nice creamy head. The head's already started to settle on this, but um, let's see what it smells like. Yeah, yeah. Yep, it smells exactly like you would expect. I mean, I just think this beer style 
you couldn't mistake it for anything other than a Belgian beer from no. Roma, could you? No, absolutely not. Um, it's got all the the classic baking spices that you that you get from yeah. a, a Belgian quad. You said it's nine point nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it smells just a touch boozy. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's give it a taste. Let's give it a taste. It's got a little bit of a, almost a fruity candy uh, taste to it that that you don't get on the nose at all. Yeah, it does. You know, dark fruit like figs or apricot, that sort of thing. Really, really good. It makes me happy that you say that because that is exactly the flavor profile that we're, that we're going for here. You nailed it. You yeah. absolutely nailed it. This is really tasty. Um, I think this would drink well uh, at room temp. Yes. As I opposed to chill. Yeah, maybe cellar temp at least. Yeah. yeah. A little warmer. Right. The notes you picked up of the sort of the dark fruit, plum, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, those have changed over time. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's become a little bit more characteristic, say in the last month that I've had mm. it. And I think give it another six months. Yeah. It would really be shining through. So we like this one. Actually, I really liked it. But what about the panel of 23 tasters? Well, participants were informed of the specific beer style and instructed to rate how hoppy, malty and dry they perceived the beer to be, with malty scoring highest. The tasters were provided a list of common hop, malt and yeast characteristics, then instructed to select from each the one they perceived as being most prominent in the beer. And spicy was the clear winner here for hop characteristic. Caramel and sweet were nearly unanimous for malt, and phenolics scored highest for yeast. But it was the next part that really held my attention. Did anybody actually like the beer? Well, tasters were asked to rate how well the beer represented the intended style based on the provided BJCP description on a zero to five scale, where zero meant not at all and five meant exactly. And the consensus says yes, most tasters thought this came close to or even nailed the style of Belgian dark strong ale. Finally, tasters were asked to rate how much they enjoyed the beer and the beer was well received by the vast majority of participants. Thank goodness. So despite the fragmented brew day and the store-bought brown sugar, this one is a winner in my book. I'm thoroughly enjoying this beer and I'm planning to age it for a year or so just to see how it continues to develop. But not every beer works out this well and if you want to see a record-breaking failed short and shoddy brew, well, watch this video here.